praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. I'm going to touch on part three today uh, from the book of Genesis. Uh, I think uh, how we uh, have to detour because of Mother's Day. So I touch on the same subject, but uh, it was totally a different thing. But today I'm going to continue on Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16 and verse 1 to verse 14. That is my text. But I will share with you something that God has put in my spirit. That uh, what God is doing that is going to be relevant in our time. And from this passage, what we can apply in our daily life to see victory and the grace of God upon our life. All right, so as I was telling you just now, we are in a time, we are in a time to experience the hand of God, the glory of God, and the victory of the Lord. It's not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. So you need the Spirit to move in your life. You need the presence of God to really permeate in your life. Because there's two things. You can be filled with the Spirit. You must also be led by the Spirit. You must also have the Spirit of joy bubbling in our life. Amen? The Spirit of joy bubbling in our life. So let's turn to the book of Genesis chapter 16, verse 1 to verse 14. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had, been, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Haggai. So, so Sarai said to Adam, uh, Abraham, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abraham agreed with Sarai's proposal. I want you to see there was a proposal. Uh, there was an agenda. There was a proposal. And they agreed to the proposal. So, so Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Haggai, the Egyptian servant, and gave it to Abraham as a wife. This happened 10 years after Abraham had settled in the land of Canaan. Verse 4. So Abraham had relationship with Hagar and she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, Hagar began to treat her mistress Sarah with contempt. Verse 5. Then Sarah said to Abraham, This is all your fault. I put my servant into your arms. But now she is pregnant. She treat me with contempt. The Lord will show who is wrong, you or me. Who is wrong, you or me? Verse 6. Abraham replied, Lord, she is your servant. So deal with her as you see fit. Then Sarai treated Haggai so harshly that she finally ran away. Verse 7. The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside the springs of water in the wilderness along the road of Shur. Verse 8. The angel said to her, Haggai, Sarah's servant, why have you come from? Where have you come from? Where are you going? She says, I'm running away from my mistress Sarai. She replied, the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Verse 10. And then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. Then the angel said to her, You are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. Then the Lord, and the Lord has heard, her cry of distress. Then verse 12, he says, This son of yours will be a wild man, as an untamed wild donkey. It's very strange, huh? Untamed and wild donkey. 
he will raise his face against anyone. It's happening even right now. And everyone will be against him. Everybody will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. Verse 13. Therefore, Haggai used another name to refer to the Lord who has spoken to her. She says, you are God who sees. You are a God who sees me. She said, have I truly seen the one who sees me? Verse 14. So the well, so the well she named Elroy, which means well of the living one has seen me. I want you to see something very important. What God was telling Elroy, the word Elroy, some of your translations you say Elroy. I want you to know God sees. The word God sees is actually in a Hebrew word, God sees. Elroy, Elroy, God sees. Let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, tonight, oh God, Lord, I pray that you'll anoint me. Lord, even as I bring your word, Lord, oh God, let there be revelation, let there be guidance, let there be teaching, let there, Lord, uh, the Spirit of God to move in the midst of us. We want to thank you for what you're doing and we want to give you all glory. In Jesus' name, we ask and we pray. Amen. I want to title this message, The Comfort of omnipresence the comfort of his omnipresence the comfort of god's omnipresence okay there are four areas that i want to touch number one he is a supplier he's a supplier number two he sees the suffering number one he is a supplier number two he sees the suffering number three he sees the slender Slendering. Number four, he sees Haggai as a sinner. He sees Haggai as a sinner. Four areas we're going to touch, and I pray that God will touch and anoint you. Now, in this chapter 16, you will see a, a situation that happened. Here, Sarai and Abraham did not have children, so they had an alternate plan for the will of God to take place. That's why I said, you know, there are two things in everybody's life. One is a perfect will of God. And the number two is a permissive will of God. The perfect will of God is what God has said in His Word concerning your life. Now, the permissive will is not according to the will of God, but it's your desire, it's your heart's uh, uh, passion, it's your prayer and what you wanted. You say, that's why God says, it's a permitted will. God then God does not agree, but you wanted, you bend the hands of God, then God says, I'll still give it to you because you wanted it. So Abraham and Sarah had argued, and in that argument, they said, this is a proposal. Well, we did not have any children, but now we have an alternate plan, and the plan is we'll get this servant girl and to marry Abraham and through him have children. How many times in our life you know, we have plan B. When God says, I got a perfect plan for you, grafted, assigned, designed for your life. But here we can't wait. Here Abraham and Sarah could not wait to see the promise of God fulfilling. They said, we are going to do something. We are going to have plan B so that the name of the Lord and the generationally God will do something to bring about victory in their life. So they began to settle on certain things and they began to see what happened. Now, in the time that uh, uh, Abraham got married to Haggai and uh, something took place, when she found out she was pregnant, uh, she began to have a pride. He says, look here, Abraham, your own wife could not conceive, but I'm a servant girl, now I conceived. So she began to mistreat Sarah. And, and conflict began to take place. I want you to see, if this is a family that has seen the grace of God, the glory of God, the power of God, the, the hands of God, and God's leading, but yet in the family, there was a, a confusion. Confusion. I want you to see sometimes, even in many Christian families, 
you know, uh, when they are walking with God and praying and, and waiting upon God, suddenly there's a conflict that takes place. Uh, there is uh, 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 interruption uh, and there is confusion uh, and hatred and argument and all these begin to cook up in a family and then you begin to say, hey God, where are you? Because I thought I'm in the perfect plan of God. I'm a child of God. I've seen the glory of God. I've seen the victory of God. But what happened to my life, oh God? I could not take it anymore, but I will do another plan Maybe you are so slow, I will take another route to see what I can come up with. That's why many people today, you know, instead of walking in the plan of God, they, they have an alternate plan and in the alternate plan, they begin to suffer distress, pain and suffering. It happens all around. It, if it happens with someone in the Bible, God has put this as an example for us to learn. Not for us, for us to argue, but for us, for us to learn and to understand what God actually is teaching. Now, here you see, then the moment of argument, the moment of argument, she went to Abraham. He says, now, I put this servant into your hand. Now, she is married to you and now she's pregnant. She said, in one of the words, she says, is it my fault or your fault? You know, confusion began to take place. Argument began to take place. And then in the argument, you know, you, you sometimes you have a lot of interruption. A lot of interruption. So now she, she, she had a, an arguing, arguing point. She said, you know, whose fault is it? Didn't they agree both? Didn't they come together and say, hey, we, we, we agree on this. And suddenly there was a, a, a difference. How many families today, husband, wife, you know, when you have a plan that is going on and you wanted to agree to do certain things and suddenly something goes wrong and then you have an argument. I think it's your fault. But in the first place, both of them agree. After that, you know, they can change the plan. Then Abraham said, I want you to know it's your servant. You choose, you deal with her as you see fit. So Abraham closed the story. He was a wise man. And then here you see, the lady take the role. Sarah took the role. She says, I want you to know authority. You are my servant. And she says, she, she began to treat her harshly. And then when she treated her harshly, she began to run away from the family. I want you to see, they all were staying together. Family began to break up and she ran away. That's why you, today you have the runaway bride. How many know the story? Oh, y'all smiling, huh? Y'all know the story. So the runaway bride actually came from here. So she ran away. Where did she run? She ran to the wilderness. When she was alone in the wilderness, I want you to know she was a heathen. She did not know God. She was a pagan worshiper, but yet God visited her because God's seed, I want you to see the seed of Abraham was in a womb and God says this is part of Abraham's seed and there was a purpose and the plan of God has to be fulfilled in their life. So now you see, she was in the wilderness, pregnant, and she was going through a tough time. She was going through a tough time. And then she began to question. She says, I know my master, Abraham, he had God's visitation. He had an encounter with God. He hears from God. He left his own home and he came into the promised land because he was walking perfectly before God. He, he was hearing God. He was anointed of God. He had the power to know what is wrong and right. But there was a mistake done. The comfort of omniscient. I want you to see the first point. His sees, God sees, and God supply. There is supplication. In this passage, we see Hagar, she run. She was on a run. In the time 
of trouble, distress. You know, sometimes when we can run even away from God, we can even run away from the presence. We can run away from our commitment. And she did that. She just run away from the commitment. And uh, now she's pregnant. And uh, she was in a terrible situation. She's in a time of ter terrible distress. Yet in the midst of the trials, she had a conversation with God. She had a conversation with God. I call that she had prayer. She prayed. A short prayer. She prayed a short prayer. And we call that prayer. I'm glad God hears me. And God answers us when we pray. And this is the promise God says he will do to everyone who calls on the name of Jesus. I want you to turn your Bible to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 65, Isaiah 65 verse 4. And this is a promise that God is saying. You know, God will be your supplier. And God will hear your prayer. In the midst of the trial, in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the problem, Haggai, you know, she was trying to find a solution. Yet, she had a conversation with God. And I call that she had a prayer and God heard her. You might be in a time, you might be in a place where you see everything was going wrong. But I want you to know, when you have a conversation with God, when you pray, when you call to God, God will answer you. How many are excited God will answer you? I want you to read Psalms, Isaiah 65, all right, verse 24. Before they call, I will answer. Isn't that wonderful? Before they call. I want you to see God will respond before you even open your mouth. That means God knows. He's an omniscient God, all-knowing God, all-powerful God, and all-present God. When you begin to call, God says, I will answer you. Let, let's read. I'm going to read from NIV. Before they call, I answer. I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. That means, you know, when they're just opening their mouth to speak, God says, I hear you already. Isn't that wonderful today? God is telling you something. You know, when you begin to pray, I want you to know your prayer is going to be powerful. God will hear and God will do wonders in your life. That's why I say prayer is a key to open every door that is shut. Prayer is a key that will unlock every door. Man is shut. Today, God will break or loose because God says, when you learn to pray, when you learn to pray, when you learn to seek the face of God, when you learn in your distress, in your trouble, when you begin to call to God, God says, I will answer you. I will answer you. Let's see. Before they call, wonderful. He says, I will answer. Before they call, he said, God. That means God is an omniscient God. He's an all-knowing God. Do you know that God knows everything that we go through? Everything, what you've been through, what you're going to go through, what, is, what you're going to even eat tomorrow. He knows. Anyway, today you have not eaten, never mind, he knows what you're going to eat. When you go out, he, he'll give you something, your idea, this is what you're going to eat. Or maybe someone, he's going to say, better fast. He says, before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, that means, you know, not only God knows the thought, God also knows, he says, this is what you're going to speak. This is what you're going to claim. Before you open the mouth, he says, I know, this is what you're going to ask. He answers. Say, God answer my prayer. God hears me. God will answer in the time of trouble. I must learn to pray. I must learn to call God. Okay, now, I want you to see another scripture. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Jeremiah, chapter 33, verse 3. He says, call to me, and I will answer you, and tell you great and mighty things 
that you do not know. Wonderful. Wonderful. Isn't that? I just want you to recall this. Call unto me. That means there is a place of calling God that's your responsibility. Say, it's my responsibility. All right. To call to Him, to call unto God. See, when you call unto me, I will answer you and tell you great and mighty things and show you mighty things that you do not know. Wonderful. God is going to reveal. You know, when you call unto God, God not only will show you, He will reveal things that is even hidden. How many want to see great things from the Lord? You must learn to pray. You must learn to pray. Amen. Now, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 to 11. Matthew 7, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 to verse 11. It says, verse 7, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Verse 8. For everyone who ask, everyone who ask, receives. Is that from the word of God? Everyone who asks will receive. How many asking? If you ask, you will receive. Doesn't matter what kind of situation that we are in, what kind of trouble we are in, what kind of persecution you go through, what kind of situation you are in. The moment you learn to ask God, the Bible says you will receive. You will receive. For everyone who asks, receive. The one who seeks, if you seek God, you'll find God. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. I want you to see, if you don't knock at the door, I want you to know this secret is not just talking. It's not just desire. It all must be soaked in prayer. There is a place that you open the secrets of God in prayer, in the chambers of prayer. That's why David says, daily I go and lock myself in the chambers of God and I will worship God and I will pray. I will meet my master and my master will commune with me and I know this is a secret plan that God has for me and I know God will answer me because I am in communion with God. If you are in communion with God, you will see the victory of the Lord. Amen? you see the victory of the Lord. Okay, now verse 9. Which of you... If your son asks for a bread, will you give him a stone? Verse 10. If he asks for a fish, will you give him a snake? Verse 11. If you then, though you are evil, knows how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask him? Your heavenly father, you must learn to have a love relationship with your heavenly father. You must have your love relationship with your heavenly father. Many of them, uh, you know, they do not know how to approach God. We think God is so far. But if you have the intimacy, if you have the love, if you have the tangible presence that is moving in your life, you will always call God the Father God. And if you know how to appreciate the Father God, you are going to see the victory of the Lord upon your life. You know, there are times that you cannot put prayer together in words. How many of them has gone through such kind of situation? At times, you know, you, you don't know how to put prayer in words. And you are sitting down there, you can't even say what you need to pray. Have you gone through? Hello? Looks like me alone. You cannot put prayers into words. What then? What then? The God who sees all things, sees even your heart, which you cannot even express. He sees everything, even though you cannot express. He hears a prayer that remains unspoken. 
You know, sometimes when, when you are in, a, in the presence of God and you do not know how to pray and you are just there in the presence of God, God says, I know what you're going through. He hears the prayer that remains unspoken. And then he says, he interprets the message of our tears. You know, sometimes you don't pray, but you are sitting in the presence of God and you, all you know is you just shed the tears. You cry, you weep. Sometimes you think, oh, they're crying, they're weeping for what? They don't understand. Sometimes some, some people try to put their hand and comfort them. It's not that comfort God was talking about. He was talking about, I know what the person is going through. I know the pain and the struggle they're going through. And when they sit down in prayer and they begin to shed their tears, I want you to know that expression of shedding their tears, God says, I know what you are going through. I know what you are going through. He interprets the message when we are in tears in the presence of God. He interprets. He reads the unspoken message of the burdens of a heart. When you are in prayer, sometimes you carry the burdens in your heart. Unspoken message. You're not able to tell to, to your loved one, to your neighbor, or even to the church member. You can't tell anyone, but you are still there. But I want you to know when you are in the presence of God, God says the message that you are carrying, the burden in your heart. I know, I know, I know. He reads the unspoken message of the broken hearted. How many of them has broken hearted? God knows. He does not need us to frame our prayer in words. But God knows what is in the depths of our heart. I want you to turn to the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 was Romans chapter 8 verse 26 and 27. Romans chapter 8 verse 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit help us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through words, wordless groaning. Wordless, that means words cannot be uttered and the spirit began to groan inside you and he's interceding on behalf of you. In our weaknesses, we need the spirit of God to help us. That's why we have, we must be led by the spirit. We must live in the spirit. You must have the spirit of joy in us, knowing the spirit of God is moving in our life. A spirit led, a spirit life, a spirit move in us to see God doing wonders in the midst of us. Now verse 27. Verse 27. And he who searches our heart knows the mind of the spirit. God searches your heart. And because you have the spirit man inside you, you have the living God inside you. You have the anointing. God says you're sealed with the seal of the Holy Spirit. And the spirit of God, who, when you're born again, the spirit of God came alive into you. And I want you to know the spirit of God is your witness. He intercedes for you and he searches your heart and knows the mind of your spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance to the will of God. He intercedes according to the will of God. I want you to see what the Spirit man can do. You know, you know, sometimes we don't move in the will of God when you are led by the Spirit. You are empowered by the Spirit. You know, that's why it's very important for us to acknowledge the move of the Holy Spirit. 
So the Spirit will intercede in your weaknesses on behalf of you with groaning. Not only, and He will pray according to the will of God. That's why we always say we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. We must ask God again to rekindle and to be filled with the Holy Spirit again and again to see what God could do in our life. Amen. Amen. Now, number two, he sees the sufferer. He saw Haggai was suffering. Haggai was suffering. Haggai the sufferer. She was suffering. Why was she suffering? Haggai, you see in this, in this passion, in these verses, Haggai is suffering. She was rejected. Number one, I want you to know she was suffering. That's why she ran away. She ran away because there was suffering. Number two, in the family, she was rejected. Number three, there was abuse in the family, in her life. She was forced to marry Abraham, a young girl, forced. There was abuse. They treat her not as their own, they treat her as a servant. If you were to read the scripture about him later, he says, she was a servant, an Egyptian servant. They never say it's Abraham's wife. They, they didn't say it's a family. They always regard her as a servant. She was abused, number four. Number five, she was hated. They hate her because she was praying. She was, you know, she was doing much more better than Sarah. She was hated. I want to see five areas. Number one, she was suffering. Number two, she was rejected. Number three, there was abuse. I want you to know they use words. If you were to really do a deep study, they, they use words on her. She was abused. The next, she was hated in the family. How many of them today, when we read this passage, we can just read and go through the next passage. But here she went through uh, 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 isolation. She went through loneliness. Unspoken words. She was suffering everything she kept inside her. She, she, she buried every of her suffering inside her heart. And she was suffering and she said, I am being persecuted. I am isolated. I've been rejected. I've been hated. I'm still living. But where is God? Where is God? She was all alone. And she was on the run. There you see, she was broken hearted. She does not know what to do because she was in the wilderness. She ran away, she was pregnant, she had a little jar of water and now she is alone in the wilderness. How many of you have gone through such kind of series in your life? And even in the younger days or maybe later part, you know what God was doing. And suddenly when everything was going well, suddenly something began to hit your life. And now you're on a run, you're isolated. People misunderstood you and people misunderstand you and you are lonely and nobody talked to you. Nobody cares for you and you think, oh, where is God? She was broken hearted. She does not know what to do. In her pain, she encounters God. In her pain, she encounters God. I want you to see, she saw God. God hears her. And that's where the word El Roy came. God hears me. God hears me. El Roy. In the time of all the pain, in the time of all the trouble, she says, I have an encounter with God and God sees me. 
Can God see you today? In the stress, in the pain, in the dilemma of your life, in the crisis of your life, God can see you. I say God can see you. God saw Hagar in the midst of that. In the suffering, I want you to know, you might be talking about God is my supplier. God meet me in the crisis. God began to feed me. God began to have an encounter. But she also went through suffering. In the suffering, she saw God. My friends, in the suffering, you can also see God. <clears throat> God will appear to you if you know how to align yourself with God. You can run away from God. You can run and run in the wilderness of your life. You can say, what am I to do? I can go on. You, you know, God says you can go on in the wilderness as long as you have your own strength. That's why instead of choosing the perfect will of God, you have the permissive will of God. You can run with your own strength and you fail miserably. And then when you fail miserably, then you crawl and you come to God. There are so many people like that I've seen. So many people. When you have all the things installed in your life, you do not know how to appreciate. You don't know how to give thanks. You do not know how to glorify. When pain strikes you, trouble strikes you, when there is no more help, you're on a run, isolation, pain, that's the time you look to God. I've seen many Christians, you know, you know when, they, they, when, when everything is mo mo moving right in their life, you know, they will be okay. When they go drift away from God, when everything go bad, then they begin to cry, where God, where are you? My friend, I want you to know the whole world is going to have recession. The whole world is going to have persecution. But if you operate according to the world standard, you will suffer with them. But the Bible says, there is no recession in the kingdom of God. I say there is no recession in the kingdom of God. There is no inflation in the kingdom of God. God is your provider. I say God is your provider. So learn to pray, learn to align yourself and you need to operate not in the kingdom of the world, you need to operate in the kingdom of God, in the principles of God, in the, in the mighty ways of God. God says, I will never forsake you, I will never leave you because you are chosen to see the glory of God. Now, in her pain, she have an encounter with God. She said, God sees. No person sees it all. Even around you, when you suffer, nobody knows. When you suffer, nobody knows, huh? You're suffering alone. When you cry, you don't go to the emporium and you cry. Have you do that? Huh? You go to crocodile farm and you cry. Crocodile say these crocodile tears. Huh? Nobody do that. You can't put an advertisement and say, hey, I'm going through pain, I'm suffering, I'm crying. No, you cry within your own self. You isolate within your own self and you begin to suffer within your own self. But God sees you. No one sees. All around us today, there are people who are suffering. They have been pain, heartache, and they keep everything within them. Hidden from those around. But I'm talking to you. Haggai went through the same situation. But Haggai had Elroy. She met up with God. Today I believe you will also meet up with God and God will do a supernatural work in your life. Amen? Amen? I say God will do a supernatural work in your life. Everyone will go through a time of suffering. Number three. Sorry, number two. Again, second point. Let me just finish a few things. In the time of suffering, God cares for you. First Peter, First Peter chapter 5, verse 7. First Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast all your how many people keep your anxiety? Huh? You keep all your anxiety, you'll be stressful. And because of all the anxiety, and you keep all those, and you do not know how to cast it to the Lord, you have body ache. 
body pain, sicknesses, disease. Because you do not know how to depend on God. You do not know how to rely on God. Here he says, curse all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Do you know how to cast it out? Do you know how to live it with God? You don't carry it. You don't carry it. You live it with God. For he cares for you. Now, next one. He's able to give you peace in your valley. He's able to give you peace in your valley. You know, in your valley, God is able to do something great in your life. Everyone will go through valley life. Not all the time in the mountain. Huh? Not all the time in the mountain. You, if you are going to go up to the mountain, you need to go to the valley to go to the mountain. If you want to come down, you still need to go to the valley. Hello? Not all the time happy. If you are all the time happy, I want you to know there is a psychiatric ward for you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, he says, Verse 6, let's just read verse 6. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Okay, can you just read? Wow, don't worry about anything. But today we worry. Price went up, petrol going up. Age also going up. Hello? Everything going up. No, nothing is going down. Everything is going up. You know why it's going up? You're not supposed to go down. You're supposed to go up. Why worry? Huh? Let everything go up. Praise the Lord. God will be your provider. Okay, can you read that? Do not... Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Tell God what you need. And thank Him for all He has done. Thank Him for all that He has done. Then you will experience God's peace. Wow. Then you will experience God's peace. You see, when you don't give to God and you keep for yourself, God cannot replace that with the peace and the blessing of the Lord in your life. All right, now. Which exceeds anything we can understand. Mm. His peace will guard your hearts and minds mm. as you live in Christ Jesus. Amen. Until verse 7, praise the Lord. God is able. I say God is able. I say God is able. Amen. Now, number three. Third point. Huh? Let me just finish up this. Third point. God sees slender. There was slandering in, in the family, in the life. Haggai was, Haggai was being slandered. They slander about her. They talk bad about her. They, 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 they look down upon her. They say things about her. Things that was not relevant, they, they, they speak it out, they slander, they tell stories. But she was a slave. Then she was forced by her mistress into a situation where she could be avoided. She was forced into to become Abraham's wife. Forced into. Slandered into. And then after that, you know, they began to talk. They slander. He says, you did this because of you. All these things happened. I want you to know every family, there are things people will do this. But you must learn to change the situation and change the environment to know that you are a child of God. You should not slander. You should not mimic. You should not complain. You should not criticize. You should not look down. Haggai could have avoided carrying the baby. But she was forced into so I know some people, you know, you don't want to be in the situation. But you are forced into a situation. You carry the load. You carry the struggle. You carry the tack, the name behind you. You, are, you have been gone through this. But I want you to know the situation is going to change. Because Elroy, God hears you. And God will change your situation. Because he's still the God who sits on the throne. And he will see you through. And he will give you might and give you victory. Because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Slender. She was forced to carry the burden. 
or Sarah's anger. She was forced. In that place of misunderstanding and slander, she find help from God. Because she ran away, that's where she met God. In the midst of misunderstanding and slander, she turned to God and says, I cannot take it anymore, God. Lord, you need to intervene into my life. I know, I know I'm going through, but I cannot help myself. I need you. I cannot do it by my own ability, but I need you. The moment you begin to recognize God is a sovereign God who can help, your situation will change. Your situation will change. Your situation will change. You know, then she says, there was so much of misunderstood, misrepresented thing that was tacked on her life. Misrepresented situation and words. Malicious gossip. Malicious gossip. She was there, yet they can gossip about her. Malicious gossip. Everything was on her. Slender was on her. She could not bear it anymore. He says, I thought everything will be okay when I agree to marry Abraham. But it turned back worse. I'm suffering. I'm in pain. I'm in trouble. She ran away. Slender will cause many people to be away from God. You need to come back. You need to tell the Lord, oh God, I need to repent and come back. Number four, when Haggai was alone in the wilderness, God see her as a sinner. Because she was an Egyptian girl who had an Egyptian culture. She had a pagan God and she did not know the living God. Yet in the midst of all that, when Elroy, God, meets up with her, her life changed. By birth, Haggai was an Egyptian. She was a heathen and she was a sinner. Yet the eye of God was upon her. The eye of the Lord was upon her. She ran away. But she, did not, she could not go very far because God was looking upon her. That was the situation in her life. The truth is, God brought her into that dilemma for her to know that she need to know the true God. When she had an encounter, how she had this encounter? She said, the God of Abraham. If you read further up in the next chapter, you say, the God of Abraham. That means she knows the master had a relationship with God and she as a pagan, she began to acknowledge the God of Abraham and the God of Abraham visited her and the God of Abraham, you know, console her and this is what I will do. If you walk in the ways of God, you will see the blessing of the Lord upon your life. Four areas. I touch all the four areas. God saw her as a sinner. When she repented, God began to bless her. God began to bless her. Amen? I said God began to bless her. I'm going to stop here. Next week I'm going to touch on chapter 17. Chapter 17. Uh, and it's going to be a very interesting thing because from the word Elroy, God began to say and move into one single word, El Shaddai. I'll touch on that. And let's just go through the book of Genesis and see what the Lord will speak to us. Amen? Praise the Lord. Tonight, I want you to see a transition from the life that Haggai went through and how God began to meet up with her and her life was changed and transformed. And today even, today even, you know, you might be in the same kind of dilemma or situation and you begin to question and say, Lord, how can my situation change? How can... My family be healed. How can my situation turn around? But I want you to know, if you begin to look to God and ask God to minister to you, 
God will be your help. God will turn all things around in your life. And that's why he says, you know, she, if you, if you were to see how Haggai, Haggai says, I know you personally. She turned. She turned the thing. And she says, I want you to know that you are my God who hears my prayer. You are my, you are my God who hears my prayer. I want you to know this tonight. God will hear your prayer and your situation will change. Whatever your situation is, I want you to learn to pray and ask God because God can change all things in your life. Amen. I want you to go back and read Genesis chapter 16. You'll see a secret of how God can explore and, uh, and transform everything in your life. Amen. I pray that you'll learn, you'll grow, and you see the blessing of the Lord upon your life. Let me just pray for you. I want every eyes to be closed. Those in church and those who are watching by television. Let the Lord begin to give you victory. Don't say the situation is so bad. You must learn to say the situation is changing because I have an encounter with God and God will bless my life. I say God will bless my life. God will heal my situation. God will be my provider. God will do wonders in my life. Today I'm going to look to God and God is going to answer my prayer. I want you to pray whatever you have in your life, in your heart. I want you to bring before the Lord and I want you to pray that the Lord will answer your prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we want to lift up every prayer request, every situation, every struggle. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, Father, you will be our supply. You will see us in our suffering. You will heal every slander. And if there's sin, Lord, you will forgive and restore our life. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, you minister to everyone in the church and also all those who are watching by television. You minister to them. Those who are sick, Lord, let them come before you and to be ministered and see the glory and the healing of the Lord upon their life. Father, I thank you for your miracle. I thank you for your healing. Bless your people right now, Lord. Break every yoke in their life, Lord. Break every bondage in their life, Lord. Break every struggle in their life, Lord. Oh God, if they need to repent, Lord, let them repent of the slander and the suffering and the misunderstood concepts they have. If they are sinner, let them, Lord, ask God to forgive them and restore their life. Father, we thank you. Today, you're ministering to us. Lord, I thank you for your touch and your grace that is upon our life. We give you all glory. We give you all praise and honor. In Jesus' name, we ask and we pray. Amen. Why don't I give a good clap offering to the Lord?